Welcome everybody to um, the second episode of our Creative Well. Thanks for joining us. If you're joining us live or on the recording, we are really glad you are here. This is a weekly podcast uh, hosted by uh, Rochelle Eason and myself, Ali Manning. Um, it is a series of conversations about creativity and life. Um, we have a special guest joining us today who I will introduce in a moment. But first of all, I want to introduce my co-host, Rochelle Eason. She has been creating pottery for a long time, since the age of four. Uh, and the last 30 years, she has been a professional artist and teacher. She was an invited artist at Walt uh, Disney World, showing her amazing oh, plant-stained uh, plant art and pottery. Um, she has been a college ceramics professor and is also a writer and an art journaler, an all-round amazing creative person. Um, I'm Ali Manning. I am a lifelong lover of books, paper, stationery. Um, I love to create handmade books and fill them with all sorts of mixed media goodness. Um, one of my passions is bringing together um, creative communities and uh, my latest endeavor is the Handmade Book Club. Um, but we are very happy today to join, uh, to have joining us Beth Bollinger, Hi, Beth, um, from nestwellness.com. Beth has a degree in design, and she originally worked in the fashion industry for companies like Levi Strauss. Um, and when her four children were younger, she um, moved into floral design for weddings and events. Um, but then one of, when one of her children um, was born with some health issues, she decided to study integrative health and um, and she began to experiment with the effects of diet on wellness. So it's a very interesting journey that we're excited to hear about, but she is currently a health, um, a healthy recipe developer. She is a content creator and a food photographer, which is how um, Rochelle and Beth met. But I will um, let Beth kind of explain her journey a little bit, how she went from working in the fashion industry to um, a floral designer, then all the way to being like a recipe creator. So um, Beth, welcome to our podcast. And would you just like to introduce yourself and talk just a little bit about your journey? Well, thank you for having me. Um, it was a, a, an interesting and uh, varied journey. I've had lots of different careers. Um, I guess my first brush with the healthcare system was when I was 23 and I had chronic chest pain. And fast forward, it was 12 years, I was 35 years old before I finally had a diagnosis. Um, and it turns out that for my particular heart condition, sugar um, is really, you know, cutting sugar out of my diet was very beneficial. Um, so 20 years ago, I cut all refined sugar out of my diet. So that was sort of the beginning of figuring out how food affects our health. And then when my daughter started having stomach problems, we went to traditional doctors. And the first thing they tell you is eat lots of healthy whole grains. So I was serving her grain for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And during that time, both my husband and I were getting sicker and sicker, and we were all gaining weight. And so I, at that point, started studying integrative health and realized that I didn't tolerate grain at all. And um, so that's when I really started experimenting with alternative ingredients and coming up with recipes that were loaded with vegetables and started sharing those with my husband's patients. My, my husband's a doctor. And so I started sharing those recipes with my husband's patients. And then fast forward to the pandemic, I created a website. I created an Instagram account and started sharing recipes that way. And I realized in the middle of the pandemic that if I wanted to get people, encourage people, inspire people to eat healthier, that the food needed to look really good too. So I learned food photography in the midst of the pandemic. And the Instagram at that point sort of took off. And now I create um, 
recipes for level blood sugar for a health company. And I wear a continuous glucose monitor to be sure that the recipes that I'm creating will produce a level of glucose response. So that's sort of my journey in a nutshell. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That is, you know, and that's how I kind of came across um, with you, with you, Beth, is that I was looking for healthier recipes to eat because of my own health journey. I have osteoporosis and I was just coming off of um, brain surgery when I was diagnosed with osteoporosis. So I had um, two ailments that I had to start eating better because of, and I'm not a cook. So um, as a potter, I started making pottery pieces that would entice me to be in the kitchen. I had to make it interesting for me. And so to fill my pottery pieces, I was looking for healthy recipes, casseroles that I could put in my casserole bakers and all of that. And so I came across you because we were doing an Instagram um, class together and I started following you because of your healthy recipes and they look so good. So I'm a visual learner. And so I needed to make something that, um, that looked good and tasted good for me to want to make them and want to eat them. And that's, and I have to say that that's what enticed me to, to come and, and follow you. And I was really excited to, to meet you. And, and, and I was hooked because of, because of what it looked like. And then it, and then it started tasting very well, very good too. And, and it started making me feel good. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> huh. okay. So I, I realized early on that, it was important to make the food look good too. So huh. that's really interesting. Um, well, it's funny because we were talking about this, like, you know, we had a pre chat last week and we were talking and I, and um, Rochelle was talking about, you know, make, you were talking about making food look good, Beth, and Rochelle was talking about how it's plated and everything. And that's something that never even occurred to me. Like, mm -hmm. wasn't even in my realm of like, how do, I didn't even think about like making things look good on the plate and then I realized we have all white china in the house like I'm not even sure I did that on purpose it's just all white and I'm thinking that's probably unintentionally just that's how it makes the food look good to me on like this nice dark mm -hmm. white background mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um, you know, we were talking it was funny because um since that pre-zoom zoom that we had I had I have mentioned that to a few different people and it was and it was funny how we all like look at our food differently. And one of the things that that came up was your recipe for overnight no oats. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that came up was because um, you were talking about overnight no oats was the replacement for oatmeal because oatmeal shoots our glucose level up, correct? It's, it makes us have a very sugary kind of start to the morning. And so this overnight no oats, um, takes that that sugar start to the morning out of our out of our mix, right? It, it helps us to get a better. Go ahead and tell us first of all why overnight no oats is a better start, and then I'll I'll tell you what I my twist on it. Okay, uh, so wearing a, a continuous glucose monitor, I realized pretty quickly that oatmeal was a major blood glucose spiker, and it's true for most of the CGM users, they, they've come to realize that oatmeal um, is not a good start to the day, basically. It's very high in carbs, low in protein. So I came up with something that I call uh, a, a no oats, and it's a combination of three seeds. It's just chia, hemp, and flax, super easy. Um, you mix it with water or with nut milk, you know, put some spices on it and it's really very creamy and it's very much like oatmeal and you can top it with you know berries or yogurt or whatever and it's very high in protein very high in fiber much much better start to the day than traditional oatmeal produces a level glucose response and it keeps me full really until lunchtime so 
And it's definitely a learning curve. So to get to <laughs> to get to enjoy the overnight no oats, it's it's a a taste that I think is an acquired taste. At first, that it was um, a tough taste for me to wrap my taste buds around, especially with the sweet tooth that I have. But I I love it now, and my body is learning to love it. It was something that my body had to um, get used to as well. But um, I was telling Al that every day that I tried it I also tried it in a different bowl and so the shape of the bowl was different the coloring of the bowl was different not only did I try different toppings in it but I I tried it in a different bowl and I finally kind of came to the the part that I I love it in this kind of round what I call a sushi bowl that I used and now I use it in that, I, I make it in that same sushi bowl every day. And I just, it, it's just this comfortable shaped bowl. It's the perfect size. And I have a half a banana and a small little handful of nuts in it. And it's just the perfect way to start my day. And it was funny because Allie's like, I just never thought about a different shaped bowl and a different color and da, da, da. And, and I was like, well, you, you drink your coffee out of a, a, a certain mug or tea out of a certain mug. And, and she said, well, I always drink, I, she likes white insides of her mug. And I said, well, I always like colored insides of my mug. And we all have these different little preferences, I guess, or quirks or whatever. And, and it, you know, and all of that makes for the moment that we enjoy our food or enjoy our drinks or, or all of that. And, and, it, and, it just, and it just kind of made me think even more about our food intake. And our food intake is not just about the actual food. And it is about those moments. And I feel like, you know, especially for me right now in the stage of life that I'm in where, where where eating and nourishment is so much more than just that meal. You know, I'm eating for my health. I'm eating, you know, I have to eat a certain amount now each day because of, you know, I've already fractured. I have a, I've, I've, I've had compression fractures in my spine because of my osteoporosis. Um, I realized just now, or just in the last couple of weeks, my arachnoid cyst in my, in my brain has now returned and after brain surgery. And so I'm dealing with that and sorry, mom, I have not told you that. <laughs> sorry, it, it just came back. And so I'm in the process of dealing with that. And so, um, you know, so I'm eating specifically for that. And so every moment is beyond just the eating for the nourishment. It's eating to combat these ailments. And the eating and the drinking is for living in that moment as well. And so um, there's so many levels to that food for me, especially, and I think for many people out there. And that's why I put so much passion into the pottery that I make because it goes beyond a mug or a bowl. It goes into those overnight no oats is really, they're really going to be enjoyable beyond the spoonful that I take. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And it just it feeds back into what Beth was saying about making food look good. Like the food photography piece, it's got to look good. And it's got to look good. You've got to feel it. You know, I feel like you've got to feel it. You own it more so than just, more so than the nourishment of this giving to you in your body. You know, it's giving you nourishment in your brain, in your, in your mental and emotional well-being as well. Well, food's yeah. a complicated thing. It's like, it's not just food. There's so much wrapped up in it. So much like emotion and cultural things. I think we'll talk about this before, like the whole cultural aspect of food as well, how we, you know, we use food in celebrations and things. And I think we all have like a really interesting, um, like relationship with food. Do you, do you like come across that, Beth? I know you used to take kind of private clients. I know you're doing that a little bit less, but um, yeah. kind of, could you speak a little bit about that? Like. Um, <laughs> In, especially in our in this country a lot of celebrations revolve around sugar and um 
you know, it's sugar is really not good for us. And most, most people eat way too much sugar. Um, so uh, the way I've kind of handled that is the celebrations in our house and for my children, we make treats with healthier ingredients. So I make sure that, you know, if I'm making a birthday cake, I'm making it with nutrient dense ingredients. So almond flour, and um, I'll sweeten it with something like maple syrup or um, monk fruit sweetener or honey, or, you know, something that at least has uh, more nutrients and is going to produce a better glucose response. Um, you know, when they're out in the world, they're going to have, you know, treats that are not like I would make. So, but, but, you know, that's part of them living in the world too. So I guess that's how I've approached it is just when the things that I provide, I make sure they're more nutrient dense. That's interesting though. You don't avoid um, food at celebrations. You don't make it into something taboo or something they shouldn't have or that they shouldn't have sweet treats. They should just be nutrient dense. Mm. Yeah. I think that's yeah, a lot I, more um, healthy. I think that that is so true because when you're talking about celebrations too, and you know, and I'm Italian and grew up with those big Italian feasts and, you know, and pastry, of course, you know, big, big meals, lots of pastry and manja, 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 you know, eat, eat, eat. And, you know, and, um, and, and, and I feel like I, I do have food issues. I mean, I, you know, and, and, and not to, not to lay blame anywhere and, and definitely not, um, and, and, and definitely had de uh, celebrations that we loved and enjoyed, but I have food issues and, and I think more from the fact that um, days of, of preparing for celebrations and 15 minutes of eating, you know, and then, and then hours and hours of cleanup, you know, I think that was more my food <laughs> issues than anything. Um, and I never enjoyed cooking, you know, I just never did. But um, I've, I'm such a sugar addict. And, you know, and I think that our culture really pushes us into being sugar addicts too and and our, and in our little town especially you know we have so many restaurants and so many new bakeries that have opened up and it's and it's all about the sugar and we have very few healthy eating spots um and we just had one of our main restaurants that are many of our, one of our main uh little kiosks that was um, in a, in a kind of trendy spot that was all vegan, just closed, you know, mm -hmm. it, it couldn't keep up with, with the demand of the popularity of, of the sugary and, you know, what was going on here. So we're not really in an area where vegan or healthy eating is, is popular and, and it's tough in this area to, you know, to, to make a, make a name for it. So, I think it's, you know, it's one of those things that people talk about wanting to eat better, mm -hmm. but this is one of my questions too, is it's a hard thing. It's, it's a really hard, it's, it's hard in the way that it is educationally challenging to remember how. And what I mean by that is, you know, even when you say, something like oh yeah that's a good thing to eat like spinach spinach is a great it's a it's supposed to be really good to eat right but mm -hmm. even like for osteoporosis you shouldn't eat spinach because it's not something that i'm sorry go ahead well cooked spinach is okay but your bones don't absorb that that like for me i'm not supposed to eat spinach because i it, i my bones don't absorb that iron so, yeah, so it's like each person has to look at what they can eat and not, you know, and what they can absorb. So, like, I have to eat um, natto. Like, I'm supposed to be eating, you know, um, to get my K2, I should be eating the natto every day. That's fermented, fermented soybean or um, prunes to get the boron 
or, you know, for the gut health. And so everybody has to look at everything, you know, obviously individually, but just because it's supposed to be good for you doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for you in particular and what you can eat in association with other things. So mm -hmm. scientifically or educationally, you have to really look at it in an individual way. And so what I'm getting at is that I wish nutritionists or nutritional experts were more available for each person or were more apt to be recommended by your doctors. You know, we're just finally getting to a point where mental health has become um, more um, common for people to be um, referred to, I guess, mental health professionals. And I wish we got to a point where nutrition experts were more common to be referred to. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. And I think, I think it's a lot of doctors still don't see the connection between nutrition and health and wellness. Um, unfortunately, there's still a disconnect. And, you know, my husband is a doctor. He had one day of nutrition in medical school. Um, one day. He ended up studying yeah. nutrition with me. So now he counsels his patient on diet and lifestyle every single day, all day long. But he's a rarity. Um, doctors, for the most part, are just starting to come around to see that what we eat affects our health. Wow. Yeah, it just, it, it just floors me because like my husband had a heart attack or a heart event at 48. Wow. Um, and, you know, he finally, I think after like several appointments after he had um, a stint put in and all of that, that they sent him to a nutritionist and that was one appointment, you know, and it was a pamphlet and this is what you should do, you know, that kind of thing. And this was, now it's been 10 years. Um, and, and, you know, and I just feel like it's something that really we should have as a regular, I think that when we go for annual exams, if, so, if, if more of us went for annual exams, but if we go for annual exams, that that should be part of an annual exam, that we should have a regular annual exam with a nutritionist. And I don't know of anybody that does anything like that. I agree. I mean, when you take your dog to the vet, for example, they the first question they ask is, what are you feeding your dog? Mm -hmm. Aren't dogs asking us, what are you eating? Right, you know? right. Yeah. And when we take our children to pediatricians, you know, years ago, I mean, all of mine are adults, but, you know, it is part of the question is, you know, I always ask, you know, what kind of nutrition should we be getting, you know, and, and we were, my, raised our children vegetarian. They always had access to um, meat. My husband was not a vegetarian, but our children always had choices um, that they chose to be vegetarian. But so we always made sure that we had those offerings and we went to pediatrician who was both traditional and um homeopathic um and um but those were always the questions but and she happened to you know give me advice as far as my nutrition uh because i was vegetarian for all those years as well and now i'm vegan i've been vegan for six years but um yeah i don't i feel like that's something and obviously i can pick up the phone and call a nutrition expert but i just feel like that's something that we should have more um and it should be more in general conversation yeah. and you're you know and i feel like that is phenomenal that you have that nutrition expertise and that you're putting it out there for us to have access to yeah can I just mention one thing though? You're saying, um, Rochelle, like, um, why don't we have access to this information? Why aren't our doctors telling us all this? I think there's sort of some very powerful people in this country who perhaps don't want us to have this kind of information, like, you know, the food industry. It's so powerful and has so much yeah. influence on everything that we do. That I, I, I mean, I don't mean to be, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. No, I think you're right. Like, it's, it's not in everyone's interest for us to know what is yeah. good for us. You're what do you think, Beth? The food industry and the lobbyists drive what the food pyramid looks like. They drive, right. you know, they, we are subsidizing wheat, corn, and soy. And so consequently, it's in everything. Right. 
Right. And they have to put creative processed foods to use these crops because they're subsidized. No, I, I think one of the most powerful things that I've seen in the last several weeks, Beth, is you wearing that glucose monitor. Yeah, can you tell us about just, that? Because Yeah, please tell us because if people need to just watch you on Instagram, and yeah, that's amazing. So it's right here on the back of my arm. Um, yeah. You wear it for two weeks at a time, and uh, you know, now and then I'll scan it with my smartphone, and it'll show me exactly what my body's response is to stress, food, um, exercise. Uh, if I've gotten less sleep, my glucose is going to be less stable the following day. So it's been really, really interesting. So you just scan it with your smartphone? Yeah. So it's a little uh-huh. button there and uh, scan it with my smartphone. And yeah. in real time, I can see what my blood glucose is. And you can just buy this from Levels Health, or do you need to be prescribed it? Or? Well, if in the United States, if to get it from your doctor, you have to be diabetic. Okay. There, I don't think there are many doctors pres- prescribing them for people with prediabetes. Unfortunately, I think that really needs to change. So there are companies like Levels Health that provide the prescription, provide the CGM, provide the app. Um, yeah, so that's okay. I, so you yeah. can purchase them privately. Yeah, yeah, great. Ooh, yeah, cool. We've included a link to Level Self, by the way, just so people can check it out because I think it's fascinating. And so, what have you, what have you discovered? And do you know other people using them? Are, is everyone going to be the same or different? No, everybody has a little bit of a different response. So, for example, um, I mean, some things are true for everybody. The things that help level your blood sugar are having vegetables or salad before your meal, you know, at the start of your meal, that helps universally helps everybody to have a level blood glucose risk or a more level blood glucose response from a meal, um, eating the carbs at the end of a meal. So if you have a plate, say of, you know, you have vegetables, you have uh, protein and you have maybe rice or something like that. You would eat the vegetables first and then the protein and then the rice last. And then for the you know the same reasoning, that's why dessert. You know, if you're going to have a little a, a treat eaten at the end of a meal. It's going to give you a better blood glucose response than having dessert by itself in the middle of the afternoon. Oh, so those well, that's interesting that are are pretty, pretty much true for everybody, but then there's individual glucose responses. So my husband gets really big glucose spikes from sweet potato, but I can eat a half a sweet potato without a big glucose response. So there's a lot of individuality, but things that seem to be true for most people are refined flour, refined sugar, and grain. Those are three that do give the majority of people a really big glucose response. So years ago, (laughs) um, my husband, I'm talking like 20 years ago, my husband was on the road working um, as a field rep and he would leave Mondays, come back Fridays. So he was eating out, he was in a hotel eating out all the time. He had gained a lot of weight and he went Uh, he had to lose it obviously and he had read this book and it was called dine out lose weight I can't remember who the author was and what they what it did was to tell you it was for these all these people these executives all that that were out in a hotel all the time and what it did was to tell you how to eat out all the time and lose weight and part of it was in your hotel room an hour before you were to go to out and eat there was certain food that you needed to eat in your room before you would go out and eat at a restaurant. And part of it was like to eat, I can't remember what it was, but it was something like cheese and crackers for an hour before you would eat at the restaurant or fruit in your hotel room for an, you know, an hour before. And I, I don't remember what it was, but it was that same idea is to eat what you were saying. You eat a little bit of something. Um, so it was in your system before you went out and ate the other part um, to, it was to balance out your 
your glucose, your sugar, your blood sugar level. And then when you went back to your room, you ate something else an hour after you wow. had your meal. And so that was exactly what they were doing. And it worked. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it was very similar to what you were talking about was leveling out those glucose levels. Yeah, well, I, I'm talking about just one meal. Um, you know, I, I don't think in general, it's a good idea to spread out your eating, you know, over several hours like that. Um, you know, the goal, you know, for most people is to get to a point where you're eating, you know, two or three meals that keep you satiated between meals. You know, a lot, we in this country, we snack a lot. Um, mm -hmm. and so, um, the idea is, you know, vegetables, protein first, carbs last. I'm going to try that. But mm -hmm. can I just ask you though, Beth, like, why do we need to keep our glucose levels even? Like, you know, why does it matter that they spike up and down? Like what, what is, what's the result of that? Yeah. So, I mean, the result of that is insulin resistance. So if you eat a big bolus of sugar, your body's releasing a lot of insulin. And um, eventually, if you're doing that constantly, you will become insulin resistant. And that's what leads to prediabetes and diabetes. Oh, okay. Gotcha. What do you, what do, what do sugar addicts like Rochelle and I do? Because I, sugar <laughs> yeah. is the one thing that I'm really struggling with right now is to give up yeah. or really reduce my sugar. Yeah. A lot of times when I see people really craving sugar, um, they're not getting enough protein. So oh. that's, you know, the first thing that I would say to look at is, are you starting your day with 20 to 30 grams of protein? Um, that's automatically to help you um, to level your blood sugar and make you less likely to have cravings. So, um, I mean, for example, uh, I had a client recently who, you know, she's eating really well. She's eating whole food. She's not eating any junk, but she was still having a craving for something in the evening. So, mm -hmm. Um, we looked at what she was eating throughout the day and come to find out, you know, breakfast, she was having, you know, one egg and some oatmeal. Uh, well, one egg is maybe four grams of protein. Oatmeal has maybe four grams of protein. So she was really low on the protein. And then lunch, she was having just a salad, no protein. Um, so again, that's set you up for afternoon hunger. Um, gotcha. to snack then in the afternoon or have a sugar craving around three or four o'clock. Um, she was doing okay at dinner, but just by changing, you know, at having more protein, less carbs, yeah. at, uh, making sure she had protein with her salad at lunch, um, that helped her quite a bit. So what about the concept of flipping your meals? You know, I've heard about that too, that people have their main meal, like even like a dinner type meal for breakfast and flipping the meals like that. Yeah, I love the idea of a savory breakfast or dinner for breakfast mm -hmm. That's, that I really agree with. Um, and I really like that idea. Breakfast doesn't have to be a sweet roll or a bagel or a donut or whatever, you know, in this country, we, or cereal, we have mm -hmm. ideas that you start your day with sugar. I don't know where that came from, but yeah. we're better off <laughs> our day with uh, vegetables or, or a bowl of soup or eggs mm -hmm. or, you know, or dinner leftovers. Right. Um, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. But see, like my dinner leftover, which is horrible. I'm like a cold pizza fiend. <laughs> and pizza is horrible. <laughs> I know. And and I, you know, so I am just I I am a am a I have to cut it completely out of my diet. Like I have to, I can't reduce. I have to cut out. Like I am, if I am zero sugar, zero carbs, I can't have it at all. If I if I have a little bit, I have a lot. 
So I, you know, I'm just, I, I really just have to cut it completely out. And when I do, I'm great. But when I have a little bit, I've fallen completely off the wagon and I'm going to have, you know, yeah. I'm going to have a ton. So, um, yeah. Thank you. I was the same way, you know, at 35, when I realized that if I consumed sugar, I was going to have chest pain and I yeah. made the that I didn't want to live with chest pain anymore. And so I had to stop cold yeah. turkey. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, if I occasionally, you know, if I go to a restaurant, for example, restaurants invariably put sugar in their dressings, in their sauces, mm-hmm. and add a lot of sugar. And I feel it, you know, I get right. chest, I get sugar in a, in a restaurant meal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I um so yeah, sugar is one of the worst things for osteoporosis for bone health. And so I and um so I am now, you know, cutting completely back. And obviously and it's actually even worse for my head. So now that I have just in the last three weeks, my brain cyst has caused, you know, it it's it's not unheard of for those to, to return. And so the symptoms have come back, just like I said, just in the last three weeks. And so I'm, I'm more apt to cut it out now because of the enormous pain that it brings back. So that I hate to say it, but that's going to be the the trigger that's going to cut it out. Um, but yeah, carbs are, you know, carbs are a thing too, because obviously they break down into sugar and, and they, they cause all problems. And my issue, and I, I'm, I'm guessing that a lot of people in our audience have the same issue is that. When you're already eating well, like I said, I'm already a vegan. So I'm already eating a really great way of eating, except for the sugar. I'm vegan plus desserts is is my thing. So I know, isn't that funny? That's my qualifier. And what that means is that I'm completely vegan and I'll add in a little bit of dairy if it's a dessert. Like I might have, um, I'll have pastry, even if it has you know, if it's made with some dairy or some egg, I'm not going to eat ice cream, but I'm going to have some dairy, whatever. I don't ever eat anything that's meat, but I'll have something, let's say it might have some honey in it. So that would be my plus desserts. Um, but I'm already eating well. And so, but I'm still not, and I'm looking back at that weight issue. I can't exercise because of my issues that I'm having with the osteoporosis. So, you know, what am I to do? What are the, what are, what is our audience to do if they're already good eaters, but we're kind of stuck? Yeah. Um, you know, we become a lot more carb sensitive as we get older. It's just a fact. Um, you know, I can't eat the way I ate when I was in my twenties or thirties. Um, I'm 55 and I am super carb sensitive. Uh, two of my kids are much more sensitive to carbs than my other two kids. So it's so bio-individual. And, you know, I would say, you know, I hear that a lot. I'm eating healthy. I'm doing all the things. Um, vegans, especially I see one, the one thing I see is a reliance on grain, which converts completely to sugar. Yeah. That's the biggest point that I, I would, you know, if I were working with you, I would look at, you know, what, what do your meals look like? You say healthy, but healthy for you 10 or 20 years ago may not be the same as healthy for you today. Yeah. 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 I don't think I eat and I don't think I eat regularly enough. I think that that's part of my problem is that I think I binge, um, in, in many ways. And I, and I don't think that I'm eating a regular, um, amount of food on a, in a, on a regular basis, you know? So you yeah, I'd have to do you not eat meals. Like, do you not have like breakfast, yeah. lunch, dinner? At certain no. Times? No? no, not really. Yeah. I think I, yeah. And I think I probably need, so when I'm making those casseroles, I'm really good at, at that. But if I'm not, that's, that's one reason. And that's where that pottery, like when I have a new release of pottery and that's so bad that 
it, it all kind of, I work so much and, I, and when I have a new release of pottery and I want to take those pictures and all that, I will cook and I will make sure that I am making um, really great photo ops. Mm-hmm. And I'm make and I know, and I'm eating and I'm making the tofu meal because I eat a lot of tofu. And so at my age, I can, I'm postmenopausal, so I can eat that tofu and I'm supposed to eat that soy and all of that. Now, my daughter, who's not, can't eat that much soy through the week. So, she, you know, she obviously can't. And I should be eating that because of my osteoporosis. But um, yeah, so I make a point of making meals and eating that kind of thing. But if I'm not, if I'm not making those photo ops, I'm going to just grab, you know, whatever. I make sure like I roast some peppers through the week and I'll eat some mushrooms and that kind of stuff. But I'm just going to grab and pick. And other than that, I'm eating vegan yogurt. And that's about it you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, but, um, yeah. Would you say that's important, Beth, like to have regular meals? Because I know some people like do do this fasting now where they skip breakfast and, or they go for like 16 hours without eating. And yeah, I mean, I do think it's important to have regular meals. Your body needs time between meals to rest and digest. Um, and, intermittent fasting I think is also important especially as we age it's important to stop eating at dinner time you know after dinner and not eat until you know go at least 12 hours between right yeah I do that yeah yeah and I do what is it the Ayurvedic is that how you say it Ayurvedic Ayurvedic eating yeah so I don't I eat between 10 and 6 and that's it 10 a.m and 6 p.m yeah yeah so it's yeah, interesting. There's so much in. out there that people choose from to, to, you know, I think that's a lot. That's something too. I wanted to bring up is that there's a lot out there for people to decide how they're going to plan their nutrition, uh, lifestyle, right. Their nutritional lifestyle. And I know for me, I pick and choose what is appealing basically, mm-hmm. you know, like the Ayurvedic, I know I'm not saying that correctly. I know you said that too. You, you say it again? Ayurveda. Uh, okay. So I, I know that I, I did kind of my evaluation and I know I need to eat between 10 and 6. So that's in my head. Um, I'm vegan. So obviously I plot that in there. Um, I, um, you know, I do the natto. So that's that Japanese fermented um, soybean. And I do, um, uh, you know, I do certain things. And so, and I pick and choose. And so that's all kind of part of my regime. I don't know if it makes sense or not. I don't even know if it works together. I just know that this is what I can do. And I know that I read, you know, this is like, this is what I use, this Healthy Bones book. That's kind of my Bible. And I know in there that one of the things that she said is to allow yourself a two-year transition time plan. You know, don't try to do everything all at once. Allow yourself two years to kind of transition into this um, way of this lifestyle for your, especially when you're approaching an osteoporosis plan. And so, you know, as I'm evolving into this new lifestyle, again, I'm picking and choosing what I think is going to work for me and that is realistic for me. I have no idea if it's actually going to be successful or not. I just know I can do it. Mm-hmm. So if you have in your, if you've decided that you're going to eat between 10 and six, what I would say is have a meal at 10, have a meal at two and have a meal at six. Don't be snacking all day long. It's harder right. to back of your calories. I mean, I, I don't, I don't suggest anyone count calories, but what I mean is it's hard to keep track of what you've consumed mm-hmm. when you're picking all day long. Mm-hmm. Um, your body doesn't have time to rest and digest between meals. Um, so, I mean, make that small change. See if that, mm-hmm. see if that. And know, see, I was count. I am counting calories. I am counting calories. And so I shouldn't count calories. I, 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 I think if you're eating whole food, you know, minimally processed food, no junk food. There's no reason to count calories. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. What do you eat, Beth? I'd love to know just like on a, like on a regular day, like what would you eat? Well, what are you going to eat today? <laughs> like, I'm going to eat 
Okay, so this morning, for example, I had a green smoothie and I had a bowl of no oats with some granola. Um, that will keep me full till you know noon or one, um, wow. and then lunch I'll have usually a salad because I can just pull from whatever I have in the fridge. So that a lettuce, some chopped vegetables. Uh, today I have some salmon, so I'll have salmon with my with my salad. Um, right. Nuts on top, or some sunflower seeds on top, um, some tahini lemon, or you know some kind of vinaigrette, or sometimes it's just a splash of olive oil and squeeze a lemon. So that's right. typically my lunch. Um, it uh, dinner it varies. This week I'm testing cauliflower pizza crust recipes. So we've eaten a lot of cauliflower pizza, week. but I try, for dinner try to have a protein. Um, two or three vegetables, um, and that's usually dinner. Yeah, nice. And the healthy to your house. Oh. Yeah, the healthy recipes that you're making. Um, are you making them for? You said you're a healthy recipe creator. Are you making them to to what end? Are they to um, are they for cookbook? Are they for doctors? What are they? Where what to what end are they for? Oh, so the recipes I, I do at the moment, um, I'm creating are for this company, Levels Health. So the recipes are using whole food uh, and there are uh, for level blood sugar. So whatever I make has to not spike people's blood sugar, basically. So um, last week, uh, I do two a week for this company. So last week was granola. Um, and it took me seven tries to get the granola right. Um, wow. So we have several jars of granola in our house right now, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, granola that you buy in the grocery store it has oats in it, and it has lots of sugar in it. So yeah. those were two ingredients that I, I couldn't use to create this granola for level blood sugar. So it's right. and seeds and lots of spices and uh, a sweetener called monk fruit that doesn't bump your blood sugar. It's amazing. Uh, those are on your Instagram, right? Yeah, yeah. Nice. That's, so, that's just so exciting to me. You know, the science, the science blows me away because of, just like you said, you know, each ingredient has its own, you know, what it's going to do. But mm -hmm. when you put them together, they, mm -hmm. they have their, they have new directives, basically, you know, it's, it's very much like plant staining. This is, this is, this is very much like what I say about the plant staining, the variables is because, you know, and even glazes and pari. I mean, this is kind of how I, how I function in my, in my thought process is that each thing functions on its own in one way, but when you put it all together, the chemistry is completely different. And that's what you're talking about is that each of these ingredients function one way on their own, but when you put them together, they function very differently. And to figure all that out, the science just blows my mind away. Yeah, it's been super interesting. Um, originally for this granola recipe, they wanted me to use a sweetener called allulose. And I really wanted to make a stovetop granola so somebody could you know, whip up a batch of granola on the stovetop. But I found out very quickly that allulose is actually flammable. And, oh. <laughs> and that, you know, I had a little stovetop fire last week. Um, so <laughs> oh there's chemistry, there's science, there's, you know, there's a lot involved in um, recipe development. Um, wow. This, yeah. That's I'm amazing. Like we've got, we've got Beth to do it for us. And then we'll just go to <laughs> Beth's Instagram and just get the recipes. <laughs> That's right. Did you catch that on, did you catch that on camera? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> a good Instagram story. <laughs> can we can we just go back a little bit to what you're eating every day, Beth? Because um, this protein issue comes up a lot. Well, it does for me anyway. So I love the idea that you know I can reduce my sugar craving by eating more protein. How do we get more protein? Because honestly, that's something I really struggle with, particularly at like breakfast. Like, how many eggs can one person eat for breakfast? And I certainly don't want to eat bacon or sausage because that's just gross. Like, yeah. how do we get that much protein in? if I don't want to do the no oats thing. <laughs> well, 
Easy way to get more protein is a scoop of collagen powder for tea. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there's 18 grams of protein in most collagen powders. So, uh, huh. I didn't know that. Well, that's a big thing in my osteoporosis groups is collagen powder. Oh, I never heard of it. Yeah. I just heard of like capsules for your skin or something that you would take as a supplement, but it's a powder, like edible. You can find marine collagen, you can find bovine collagen. Um, I don't know what you would do as a vegan. What do you I don't know. I haven't because they talk about it in my osteoporosis groups, but they, it's not vegan from what I've seen. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Would oh. you be a marine collagen? Mm -mm. I, no, because it's not vegan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's the whole thing is that there's a lot of these supplements that are not vegan and, um, and even a lot of them that um, the capsules that, you know, in, in some of the other supplements that they do the even the capsules are not um vegan or anything like that yeah it's frustrating hmm. but yeah that's interesting though that i've that i've seen yeah mm -hmm. or i might i might check out that collagen powder so you just get it in like a whole foods or something and it's just yeah. like, a, like a creamer type thing yeah costco even has it right now mm -hmm. really oh wow one a blue canister called vital proteins that they carry mm -hmm. it Right. One of the things that I do a lot, like I do a lot of tofu, I do a lot of nutritional yeast mm -hmm. um, that has some protein in it. And I do, um, what else do I do? Um, I don't know. I can't remember. There's something else that I sprinkle on, on things that has protein in it, but um, yeah. And parts have a lot of protein. I'm sorry, we lost your audio for a minute. And parts have a lot of protein. Hey, but Oh um, yeah, hemp hearts. Okay, so that was in that's in the um, the no oats. So I have that. Yeah. What, what so I can sprinkle that on things too. A lot of other things too. Good, a salad or yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to like? ask you. The those ingredients in the no oats. What else can they be used for? Because I have all of those. Uh, well, I, I mean, you could make a chia pudding, um, just with the chia seeds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can use flax or chia as a, an egg replacer mm -hmm. in baking. Maybe you already know that since you're vegan. Yeah, I, I, I had the flax seeds from before for something else. Yeah. I just couldn't remember what I had them for. <laughs> I had them in my pantry <laughs> and I don't remember what I had them for. I make uh, crackers, um, chop and soak nuts with flax chia until it makes kind of a slurry. And then food dehydrator and spread that on uh, the food dehydrator sheets and make cracker. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I think I had made like date balls or something. Is that what I had? I think I had made something like that before. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask like you some of these recipes. Yeah. So oh. there's, there's so many, there's, there really are a lot of, um, there's a lot of things out there now that are very healthy to make um, and interesting to make, I should say, mm -hmm. with hemp hearts and like you said, the flax seed and all that, that are like the, the balls. I wanna say like the little raw balls. Yeah. I have seen like we have a, a juice place that, that makes a lot of those little raw balls right. with a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. um, and once you start to make one kind, I think it's one of those things that you just start to substitute them in, you mm -hmm. know, different ingredients in once you just get to, you you know, to use them. I'm, but I'm wondering if there's protein, like for those of you that would do the collagen, just substituting the collagen powder in for some of that, if you could just pop those, mm -hmm. you know, like if you wanted a little cookie or something like that, is that something that you could just pop in the collagen powder into some of those and have like a little one of those in the morning? Good. And I would just say the, you know, the only thing about those is sometimes they're little sugar bombs, you know, the, oh, mm -hmm. the little protein balls. Um, mm -hmm. Possible to make them mostly with nuts and seeds and some collagen or some protein powder and just a little bit of maple syrup or something as a binder. Um, yeah. But just make sure it's not like I had one recently uh, at a coffee shop and it said 
you know, keto protein bars was the way mm-hmm. they built. Um, and it was mostly dates and some. So look out for, for those that are just sugar bombs. So if you're making them on your own, what would you make them with? So they w- work sugar bombs. Uh, well, I would u- use mostly nuts and seeds and, um, you know, protein powder or not. And mm-hmm. depending, you know, if you were using them as a, you know, a source of protein, but then just enough dates or mm-hmm. uh, monk fruit syrup or something to hold it together. So it's not like mostly dates with mm-hmm. a few nuts. So, so I guess that's what I was saying. Is there something that you could use to hold it together that was not syrupy, like not sugary that you could yeah. think of? I, I mean, there is something called monk fruit syrup. That's what you were, okay. Not affect your blood sugar. And it it's the consistency of maple syrup. So something like that would hold it together without adding sugar to your diet. Okay. And where would you find something like that? Monk fruit, uh, whole foods. Um, okay. You know, sometimes I order things on Amazon just because it's easier than searching grocery stores. Right. Yeah. And I do. And I, uh, that's what I was going to say that natto that I get. It's the Japanese fermented um, soybean, which is the, it's the best source of K2 um, in food. I order that through Amazon and it's the vegan version and it comes straight from New York and it, I get it in a, it's a, in a refrigerated package. So it's fresh. And I have, that's the only place I can get it that's vegan is through Amazon. So how do you use the natto? You- so I put it in miso soup. Oh yeah. And um, I honestly, I like the t- flavor of it. It was kind of another acquired taste. And because I have to eat three teaspoons a day to get the source that I need, I really, I put it on anything. So um, if I'm not eating miso soup every day, I am literally, sometimes I just put it on a cracker or something just to get it in me. And sometimes I will literally just eat it with a spoon just so that I can have it each day because I have to have it. Yeah. So I just go back to, you know, these, uh, you talk about the dates and creating these little um, sugar bombs. Mm-hmm. Is that something we should be avoiding, like a lot of um, dried or fresh fruit, Beth? Do you feel like that spikes our blood sugar too? Because I'm a, I have a lot of fruit for breakfast in a protein, like smoothie type thing. Yeah, you know what I what I have found is that yes, fruit does spike my blood sugar quite high. Um, fruit in combination with protein mm-hmm. is yeah. Um, but if you're having a fruit smoothie. Um, for breakfast, um, I would just say start adding more vegetables and less fruit to your smoothie. Um, you know, make sure that you've got at 20, 25, 30 grams of protein for, with, with that smoothie. Um, yeah. 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 I've really stopped eating fruit. I know that's probably horrible that I've stopped, but I've gone more, yeah, I've gone more to vegetables. I'm like, challenge on, down on kale salad as much as possible and I do not like kale but mm-hmm. I've gone more I have got I used to love spinach now I've gone to kale and yeah, yeah. I've tried so much yeah well, that's good that's but good. because I would eat because I would eat fruit all day long if I could so yeah. I've had to go yeah, yeah. and gone to vegetables and choosing lower glycemic fruit like berries is going to be than oh, tropical. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Blueberries are supposed to be really, really good for osteoporosis. So if I do anything, I will do blueberries. <laughs> all right. Well, ladies, we, we've talked for a whole hour all about food. Wow. Oh, yeah, of course, I'm hungry. I'm ready to have a lunch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> want to thank you, Beth, so much for um, joining us and like sharing all your wisdom about food and I encourage people, um, I will drop a link in to Beth's website and, well, I already have, to Beth's website and to um, her Instagram. And um, so please, we encourage you to um, check out her wonderful recipes and her wonderful food photography. So thank you, Beth, for being here. And Rochelle, do you want to talk about what's coming up next? Yes, and you can also um, go to rochelleeason.com forward slash Our Creative Well, and all of the links are there for Beth, as well as for Vintage Page Designs with Allie Manning and all of my information with Rochelle Eason. 
next time, which will be two weeks from today, we will be, Allie and I will be live again, and we will be talking, it'll be just the two of us, we will be talking about sanctuary and creativity. So join us on May 19th, right here for our Creative Well with Allie Manning and Michelle Eason, Sanctuary and Creativity. We'll see you then. And thank you for joining us today. Beth, thank you so much for joining us. This was a wealth of information. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you for having me.